Euphemism is a powerful tool. Soften your language and behold the world through rose-colored lenses. That's why if you're shopping for a used car, odds are you'll end up talking to a certified pre-owned specialist. If you have a hot date tonight and you're optimistic about your prospects, you might swing by the old family planning aisle on your way into town. But those are euphemisms for relatively benign things. Euphemism gets more consequential when the thing you're trying to minimize is quite large on the scale of awful. So let's try one of the tougher ones. Female genital mutilation. What's the euphemism for that? Surgical abstinence encouragement or maybe preventative libido intervention? The term anthropologist Dr. Fwambai Amadou uses is simply female circumcision. As she explained this week in an interview with Tucker Carlson, which I will discuss momentarily. But first, the context of that interview is important. Tucker hosted this defender of female genital mutilation, and I will use that term not just because I think it's the accurate one, but because the World Health Organization does too. Because two physicians and one of their wives are being charged with performing the procedure, allegedly doing this to two seven-year-old girls in their medical offices outside of Detroit, Michigan. Without getting too graphic here, what we're talking about is a range of procedures that partially or totally remove the external female genitalia for entirely non-medical reasons. These are religious reasons associated with Islamic culture, especially common in sub-Saharan Africa. The allegations against these Michigan doctors are on the less extreme end of the FGM scale, apparently involving a scraper to remove the girl's genital membranes. Federal law has been on the books since 1997 against all FGM practices, but these are the first ever charges for violating it. The accused physicians are in jail, deemed a danger to the victimized girls and a flight risk. And they face up to life in prison if convicted because the charges also include conspiracy to transport minors to commit criminal sexual activity since the victim girls came from Minnesota for the procedure. Yeah, good. That's my simple answer. But what would I know? I'm not cultured. So let's get the anthropological expert in here to explain why the injustice is not what was done to these girls. The injustice is punishment for this perfectly acceptable cultural practice. Prepare for enrichment. You seem like a reasonable person and a well-educated person. Mm -hmm. It's amazing to me that anyone could defend this. Okay. On what grounds would you defend it? So when you opened just now, you said that I defend FGM. Yes. And I don't defend FGM. I don't defend Good. mutilation. I would never defend the mutilation of anyone. I don't uh, identify with the term FGM, with the term mutilation. I would say the um, great majority of women who are affected by what I call female circumcision practices do not see themselves as mutilated. Notice her first argument is simply semantics. She's not disputing what the procedure actually is, not yet at least. She's just trying to control the terms we use to refer to it. But a rose by any other name would smell just as sweet. And FGM by any other name would smell just as barbaric. And she says, I don't identify with the term mutilation. Neat. Your personal experience of undergoing this procedure as an adult is hardly representative of the overwhelming majority of global cases where the procedure is conducted on an unwilling child in often medically unsanitary circumstances. And regardless, this is still an argument about the words that we use rather than the action to which the words are referring. I don't identify with the term murder. I prefer to say neutralizing antagonist. I don't really identify with the term theft. I prefer to say proactive redistribution. What you don't identify with is the term honesty. You prefer convenience and distraction. I almost don't want to specify what it refers to because it's upsetting. I think we should. But it's the removal of a kind of key female sex organ right. in a lot of cases on, and this is being done to girls mm -hmm. who obviously can't give consent okay. and it affects them for life. That so, would be my perspective. Right, so Tucker, this is why I think we do need to have a discussion on what it is. Because when we use the term female genital mutilation, automatically a certain uh, image comes to mind. It's the idea of the most horrific type of procedure, which is type 3, WHO classifies this as type 3 infibulation that involves the suturing and sewing up of the labia majora. This is a very rare procedure that is confined basically to a specific part of Sub-Sahara Africa, the Horn of Africa. We need to understand that over 90% of what we call female circumcision involves what WHO classifies as types 1 
Right. And that's divided into types 1A and B and types 2 A and B as well. The distinction she's making is like making a distinction between Anthony Weiner and Jerry Sandusky. It's a distinction that does matter. One is clearly worse than the other, but we're still entirely within the scope of the awful and nowhere near the scope of the good. It's interesting she first says the term female genital mutilation is inappropriate to apply to the less extreme forms of the procedure, and then cites the World Health Organization in support of the claim that the bulk of the world's cases are on the less extreme end. Indeed, the WHO does acknowledge the different types of the procedure, but they all fall under the category of mutilation. And the organization regards all types as a violation of human rights. So the WHO is correct with its statistics, but wrong in characterizing FGM as abuse. That seems to be her argument. Why would we believe their statistics, but not their terms? They do identify with the term mutilation. And if you're going to cite them, shouldn't that matter? Now you underwent this as an adult. There's a quantum difference between making a decision to do something mm -hmm. like that and having that decision made for you mm -hmm. that cannot be reversed as a child, that seems to me probably the worst thing you could do a child. Okay, so back to the um, the case of the 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 Dawdi Bora doctor who's now right? in prison waiting trial. Um, she is accused, she's charged of F, with FGM, mutilating two right. seven-year-old girls. She performed NICS, NICS, type 1A, to the uh, the clinical yeah, I don't I don't I don't know that but I don't it's really know that that's, I don't know because that that's what's true. happened is it is true according to reports it is true that the procedure performed on these girls in Michigan was on the lesser end of the FGM scale but the question was about children's consent whether we're talking about a nick as she puts it or a more extreme form of the practice why should a child who is unable to consent undergo a procedure that will permanently alter his or her body. That question, of course, invites comparison to male circumcision, which we'll address in a moment, but for now, she again deflects to minimizing the practice. The core issue here is not the severity of the practice, though that is important. The core issue here is the practice is rarely done with the consent of the subject and she never directly addresses that problem. There's one thing I want to correct. You said it removes a vital part of the female genital anatomy, all right? And is it okay if I actually say what that part is? Because there's a misconception about what actually, you know, what these surgeries entail. There is no female circumcision procedure that removes the clitoris of a woman. It is absolutely impossible to remove a woman's clitoris without killing her. What is exposed is a tiny fraction of what is actually an extensive organ. I'm no physician and I haven't taken anatomy since high school, but I will note the World Health Organization disagrees with that claim. According to them, even the allegedly benign type one form of the procedure she keeps defending includes the partial or total removal. There are a lot of men right, who have experienced male circumcision, who say that this is mutilation. In fact, in the courtroom, when Dr. Nargawala appeared in court, there were protesters outside. What I'm saying is, you're, you're, you're saying to me that there are opponents to female circumcision. Look, as you feel, know, there's a lot mutilated. of research, I don't want to get into the circumcision debate on mm -hmm. men, but there's, but re should. there's research, okay, well then there's research that shows there, there are profound and medical advantages in that first of general mutilation. All, that research, research is contested. There's a lot of research out there that says, yes, there is harm, there is risk. Look, there are over I, I, I don't, deaths, we, th that's a hundred deaths show. each year from that's male circumcision. That's a separate show. And I you could have predicted the discussion would go this route. Well, we already cut one, so why not cut the other? There are several key differences to note, however. First, the anatomical and physiological difference. The foreskin and the clitoris are not functional equivalents. We're talking apples and oranges here, or bananas and peaches, if you will. Second, we're talking about a medical versus a non-medical procedure. She is right that the benefits of male circumcision are debated, but there is at least evidence that it's beneficial, and at worst, not harmful long-term. Female circumcision, as she calls it, however, has no medical benefits and is associated with several serious long-term complications. This again, according to the WHO, the reliable source for stats, but nothing else on the topic. And considering the benefits and the risks of each illustrates another key distinction, the intent of the procedure. Male circumcision is conducted with the health of the child in mind. Again, debated, granted, 
but that is the intent. And FGM's intent, controlling women's sexuality. Actual patriarchy, actual oppression. But let's grant all her positions. Let's say male circumcision and FGM are actually the same. She's still arguing that male circumcision is bad. She says it's protested, that its benefits are contested, that it causes a hundred deaths a year. You don't justify one bad thing by pointing at another bad thing. If I listen to her case, I probably conclude, you know what, let's do neither. I wouldn't conclude, let's do both. I Simple. think if we accept it in American society that we do remove, or we, can, we do remove the foreskin on boys, we okay. do practice genital cutting here in the US on boys, then it should not be impossible to understand that there are cultures, there are societies that practice what uh, certain people are now calling gender. I just, I just don't want surgeries. it in my culture, in my society. I guess that's but kind of what so it comes okay down to. It's okay to cut boys in no, I'm not society? saying, look, I'm just saying I don't want this because I think it's awful. Well, we don't, in, in our culture, we don't discriminate. We don't, we have gender egalitarian <laughs> okay. surgeries. Yeah, gender egalitarian surgeries in the same way ISIS delivers gender egalitarian justice. Equal opportunity abuse is still abuse. And it's on you, ma'am, to tell me why it's good. Equal distribution of a bad thing does not make a good thing, but she never does. Even if we're charitable with her, she never offered a single reason to support the primary case to be made. That FGM is good, or at the very least, not harmful. The best case she made was, oh, it's not that bad. Hey, look, something else bad right over there. Yeah, look, right over there while I, uh, take care of something over here. And I suppose she doesn't make the case that FGM is beneficial because it isn't for anything other than barbaric religious reasons. I'm all for religious freedom, but I don't think the free exercise of religion includes the permanent disfiguration of a child who is unable to consent. After all, that's even worse than using your religious freedom to refrain from baking a cake against your will. And while this interview did bother me, I am glad that Tucker hosted her. She is fringe, to be clear, at least in terms of public opinion, but not as fringe as you might think in terms of influence. She worked at UNICEF, the United Nations Children's Fund. She also worked for the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development, the federal agency conducting research in children's health. So this lady was, at least at some level, informing federal policy on the health of our children. She is a fox to our daughter's hen house. In that context, I'm glad I got to hear her speak. And I'm glad I got to learn more about the issue. Better the devil we know than the devil we don't. Even if that devil distributes his torture equally across both genders, still gotta keep an eye on him. Thanks as always for listening and for supporting this channel always. Appreciate that thoughtful discussion down below and especially over on Twitter. That is at ML Christensen. You're always welcome to come hang out and chat in my live streams. Those are linked down in the description. Looking forward to it. Kidding.